The first view of metaphor that we're going to talk about is what we might call the simile view of metaphor. And it's probably the basically the simplest view of metaphor you could come up with. It's what you might come up with if you were asked the question, well, what is a metaphor? What is a metaphor saying? So let's remind ourselves what a simile is. A simile is when you say that one thing is like another. So if I say life is like a journey, that's an example of a simile. If I say a car is like a horse and cart, except it has an engine, that's a simile. So a simile is a sentence that has like when you're saying, when you literally are saying one thing is like another. And it's important to recognize that a simile is not a non-literal use of language necessarily. Similes can be perfectly literal. When I say that a car is like a horse and cart except it has an engine, that can be something that's literally true or false, and all I'm trying to do is communicate just the literal truth or falsity. So that's what a simile is. What's the relationship between similes and metaphors on this view? Well, on the simile view of metaphor, basically what happens whenever you say a metaphor, what you're really saying is you're, trying, you're really trying to communicate a simile instead, a, re, a nearby related simile. So let's take an example, the one on your handout. So I might say, life is a journey. That's a metaphor. It's a metaphor because life is not, strictly speaking, literally a journey. I'm saying something metaphorical. I'm saying, well, there are kind of features that journeys have that maybe life has as well. Especially in a simple example like that, the simile view looks really promising because what the simile view says was, well, what you're really saying is just life is like a journey. Whenever you have a metaphor, there's a nearby simile and that's the thing that you're really trying to communicate. Metaphors are always just similes with the like left out, is the way you can think about it. In fact, you can think of this account as saying, well, metaphor actually really is a kind of loose talk. So remember, we, we said what loose talk was in the last example, when I say somebody is six foot tall, even when they're a shade above six foot. That's an example of loose talk because they're close enough to six foot tall for what I'm saying to be appropriate. And nobody thinks I'm saying that they're exactly six foot tall. Everybody understands me to be saying that something like they're roughly six foot tall. The simile view of metaphor is something like a loose talk account of metaphor. Because the idea is, well, whenever you say a metaphor, nobody understands you to be saying exactly the content of what you're saying. They don't extend, expect you to be saying exactly what you said is true. Rather, they understand that there's really a like in there that you've left out. Really, you're saying a simile, and you just didn't, you just sort of didn't bother saying it properly. That's what the simile view of metaphor says. Every time you use a sentence metaphorically, what you're, what you're expressing is a simile like that. Now, there are a number of advantages of the simile proposal. It's very simple, it's pretty obvious, but uh, there are actually some good features of it. So, the obvious views are not always hopelessly bad. The first good feature of the simile view is that it does seem to capture something important that we use metaphors to do. So if I use a simile, I usually do that to express some sort of comparison. I express some sort of comparison between life and a journey. I'm saying that there's some features that they both have. And this does seem to, be, at least in some cases, to be something that we're trying to do with metaphors. When I say, when I just say life is a journey, I seem to be doing a similar kind of thing. I'm inviting a comparison between life and a journey. I'm communicating that maybe there are some properties, some features that they both share. So that is something that the simile view does have going for it. There is something comparison-like often that goes on in metaphors. The other thing that's good, the other two things that are good about this account relate to the questions we talked about in the last video. So in the last video, we said that one question we're interested in is what exactly do metaphors communicate? Do they make assertions or do they do something else? The simile view gives a very straightforward answer to this question. It says, well, yes, metaphors do make assertions. They just assert the related simile. So when I say life is a journey, there is something I'm asserting, namely that life is like a journey. So on the simile view, we're able to say nothing very special is happening whenever we say use a sentence metaphorically. 
Now, we're not expressing exactly what the sentence says, but we are asserting something. We're asserting the simile that's nearby. There's a very straightforward answer to the second question. When you use a sentence metaphorically, you are making an assertion. You're making the assertion that the related simile makes. The other question we talked about is, well, how do you figure out what a met how do you figure out what exactly a metaphor is doing? How do you know what the speaker is trying to make you understand or what effect they're trying to produce? And again, the simile view seems to have a fairly simple explanation. The explanation is, well, if somebody says something metaphorically, if they use a sentence metaphorically, well, you just put a like somewhere, and that's your and that and that is basically what's going on. If I say life is a journey, how do I figure out what the speaker means? Well, I just insert a like. I find the simile, life is like a journey, and I think, well, that's what they're saying. So this account, the simile account, gives a very straightforward answer to our third question as well, of how does the listener figure out what a metaphor is doing? It's very simple, according to the simile account. You just stick a like in there, and you, find, you thereby find the nearby simile, and that's what's being communicated. So we said that there are some advantages of this account, and there are important advantages, but there are also some pretty serious problems too. The first problem is that it actually doesn't always seem like the, the nearby simile, as we're calling it, really does capture the meaning. In this case, it worked fine. We had a very simple metaphor, and we said that if you just put in a like, what the speaker is expressing seems to be more or less the same thing. But this was a very simple example of a metaphor, not, not a very complicated or nuanced example. And we've, when we focus on more complex examples, more nuanced and more interesting examples of metaphors, it's not really clear whether this really works so well, whether you can really find what exactly the content of the metaphor was by just putting in a light. This point is made really nicely by philosopher Bill Lyson. So he focuses again on a line from Shakespeare, and the quote is, as it's written on your handout, when the blood burns, how prodigal the soul lends the tongue vows. So that's kind of complicated, but the basic idea in this context seems to be something like, when you're really worked up or you're very passionate about something, it's very easy to make promises or commitments or you know to speak out in certain kinds of ways. Something like that is basically what Shakespeare or the character um, in the Shakespeare play means by saying this line. So that's what the metaphor is sort of being used to do. Is that what the simile account predicts? So the simile account says, well, what this means is the same thing as if you just stick a like in the appropriate place. That's what the metaphor means, and that's how we figure out what it means. We just stick a like in. But as Lyson points out, it's not really clear that that works so well in this case. Because how would you do it? So remember again, the line is, when the blood burns, how prodigal the soul lends the tongue vows. How would you put a like in there to turn it into a simile that seems to work, that seems to communicate the same content? Lyson sort of goes to extremes by giving it a way that you might do it, which is really, really long and quite clearly is missing a lot from the original metaphor. So he comes up with something like, well, when something which is like a person's blood does something resembling burning, how prodigally something else, which is like a person's soul, does something similar in, in lending some things that are vow-like to a third thing which resembles a person's tongue. So again, that's all on your handout. Now that is a simile. It's a sentence that could be literally true. It's not literally false in the way that metaphors usually are. But does that simile really seem to capture the meaning of the original metaphor? Arguably not. The simile that Lyson has come up with is really pretty extremely vague. It doesn't really have, it's, it's not really clear at all what it says. And whatever it does say, it seems to be pretty short of the original meaning. Because remember, the original meaning we talked about was something like, something about what you're inclined to do when you're worked up. Like maybe you're inclined to make promises or to lash out or something like that. And none of that is communicated by this really weird, long, complicated simile. And it's not just that Lyson has, has done, the, done a bad job of it. If you try and take that original Shakespeare line and express it as a simile, it's really hard to figure out how would you actually do it in a way that captures the meaning of the original. With a really vivid metaphor, like the original Shakespeare one, it's hard to come up with a simile that communicates the same thing. 
But that's a serious problem for the simile view, because remember, on the simile view, that's exactly what a metaphor is. A metaphor just is a simile, sort of said badly. And if we can't find a simile which seems to express the same thing as Shakespeare's metaphor, that's something that shouldn't happen according to the simile view. So if it is happening, that seems to be some reason to think the simile view is wrong. The second problem goes sort of in the other direction. So the problem there was sometimes there are metaphors and it's hard to find any simile which corresponds to them that could be communicating the same content. The second problem goes sort of in the other direction. There are some things that are really easy to understand as similes, and yet it's hard to understand them metaphorically. So lots of things, so it's, lots of things are, are like each other. It's very easy to say that they're like each other. So if we think about just cutlery, we could say things like chopsticks are like knives and forks. And that seems to be true, at least in certain contexts, because the kind of thing that you use chopsticks for is similar to the kind of thing that you would use knives and forks for. So that's a true simile. A question now is, though, could we express the same thing as the simile says using a metaphorical speech? So could we say something like chopsticks are knives and forks to metaphorically communicate the simile that chopsticks are like knives and forks? And here my feeling is that that does not sound so good. It's hard to understand chopsticks are knives and forks in a metaphorical way so that it says that chopsticks are like knives and forks. You can maybe hear it as saying something like they're equivalent to knives and forks. There are other ways to understand what somebody might be saying using the sentence chopsticks are knives and forks, but it doesn't seem like we understand it metaphorically. In lots of cases when we say chopsticks are knives and forks, it will sound false. In the other cases where it doesn't sound false, we really we understand the speaker as saying, so, as saying something other than a metaphor. So basically, the problem here is that the simile account says that there are more potential metaphors than there really seem to be. So it's not clear that you should be able to use the sentence chopsticks or knives and forks metaphorically to say something like they're like knives and forks, but it's kind of puzzling on the simile account why this should be. Because on the simile account, whenever you're using a sentence metaphorically, you're just saying that one thing is like another. That's all you're doing whenever you use a metaphor. So it looks like we should be able to use this sentence metaphorically, and it's not really clear that we can, even though there's a perfectly good simile there that we could be expressing. That's another problem for the simile account. Sometimes there are obvious similes, which it's not really clear you can express metaphorically, or not in the, not in the obvious way, metaphorically. The final problem is that sometimes the simile itself is, a meta is, is not literary too, but rather it's, it's metaphorical. So in the, in the text you read, there's this nice example of a line from Sylvia Plath. So I'm going to slightly adapt the line to make it shorter. So take a me metaphor like, I am a mirror for my surroundings. According to the simile view, what would be the simile that I'm trying to express? Well, it would have to be something like, I am like a mirror for my surroundings. And that does maybe seem to be something you could truly say in a case like that. But the thing we got to ask here is that, is that, is that simile itself literally true? Or is it itself a kind of metaphor? And it looks like when we start to unpack the simile, it actually seems to have metaphorical properties. Because if one thing is like another, it's presumably because they have some property, properties that are similar. There are some things that there are some features that they share. So if I am like a mirror for my surroundings, we have to ask, well, what properties do I share with a mirror for my surroundings? And the answer would be something like, well, that I reflect my surroundings, or you know, that we can see my surroundings in me, just like you could see your surroundings in a mirror. But those respects are kind of metaphorical. Like I don't literally reflect my my circumstances in the way that a mirror might literally reflect its circumstances. You can't literally see the world in me in the way that you might literally see the world in a mirror. So it looks like the respects that are supposed to make the simile true are, are themselves these kind of metaphorical things. It's this idea, it's this metaphorical idea of reflection rather than the literal idea of reflection that makes the simile true. But if that's the case, if the simile is true by thinking about these properties we share metaphorically, rather than properties that we share strictly speaking literally, it's actually not clear whether the simile itself is an example of literal speech. 
it looks like the simile itself is a metaphor that has to be cashed out. And it's actually not really clear, once something already looks like a simile, like how would you turn it into a literal simile? So the simile we're using to cash out the metaphor is not maybe something that's literally true, it's only metaphorically true. But how do I take a sentence like, I am like a mirror for my surroundings, and turn it into a simile that is strictly speaking literally true? That's not obvious how you should do that, but it looks like it's something we would have to be able to do on the simile account. So that's the final problem for the simile account, is that sometimes the obvious simile that we might use to cash out the metaphor itself seems to be a sort of metaphor that's hard to cash out in literal terms. I'll mention briefly here at the end a slightly better version of the simile account that's talked about in the paper on metaphor that you read. And this is the account from Fogelin. Because so far all we've said is that when you say something metaphorically, you're just expressing a simile. So when I say Juliet is the sun, we're really just saying Juliet is like the sun. One thing we might try to do to save the, to save the simile account is to say, well, it's not likeness or similarity in any respects. It's got to be in some particular respects. So really, when you say Juliet is the sun, you're, you're not just saying Juliet is like the sun. But you're saying she's like the sun in certain particular respects. And we might stipulate that the respects in which they're supposed to be similar, the, the respects or the features that we're comparing, they have to be sort of non-obvious things. They can't be like just straightforward physical properties. Like it can't be just that we're saying one is literally bright. They have to be sort of higher order or more figurative properties. This might help with our second problem, the one where it seems like not just any simile can be turned into a metaphor. Because we might think, well, the problem with the chopsticks example is that a simile, when, a, when we think about a simile like chopsticks are like knives and forks, the reason why that's true is because we're focusing on very obvious physical or functional properties of chopsticks that they share with knives and forks. But you might think, as this theory is saying, that we actually have to focus on more abstruse or less obvious similarities in order to make a metaphor true. Metaphors are specifically for talking about similarities or comparisons between non-obvious properties that they share. And that would help with this second example. It would mean that it would explain why it's not possible to always just take a simile and turn it into a metaphor. Because it's only a certain subclass, it's only a special case of similes that, are, that correspond to metaphors in the first place. So arguably this specific version of the simile view will help with the second problem. It's not really clear it will help with the first or the third problems, though. Why is that? Well, because in both the first or the third problems, we kind of didn't really know what the right simile to choose was in the first place. So think about the Shakespeare line. The problem the simile view had there is it's really hard to find any simile which communicates the same thing. Any simile you might think of seems to say something much vaguer and much, you know, much, much more hollow than the original line from Shakespeare. Likewise with the, the line like I'm a mirror for my surroundings, it's hard to find any simile, not just one that focuses on the relevant respects, it's hard to find any simile which says the same thing in non-metaphorical terms. So restricting the kind of similarities that we're interested in when we state the simile won't necessarily help us with the first and the third problems because we didn't really have any idea of what the right simile would be in the first place. And just restricting it to non-obvious features, well, that doesn't really help us because we, we don't know what the non-obvious features in these cases might be. So what we did in this video was we looked at the simile view of metaphor. The simile view says that when you use a sentence metaphorically, you're really just asserting a related simile. We saw that there are some good features of this account. It captures the idea that metaphors very often are used to make comparisons. That's a thing metaphors genuinely are used to do. It also gives us a clear answer to questions two and three from the previous video. It says, well, the content of a metaphor is just the related simile, and the way that you figure out what a metaphor is doing is, well, you just find the nearest simile. But it looks like there are pretty serious problems for this account, despite those advantages. The first is, it's just not always obvious that there is a simile which says the same thing. It's very hard in Shakespeare's example to find a simile that says the same thing. We also have the problem in the other direction. Sometimes there are similes where it's very hard to find a metaphor that says the same thing. That's what the chopsticks example was supposed to show. And then finally we said that, well, sometimes the obvious simile seems to itself be metaphorical. That's what the Sylvia Plath line showed. 
when we have a line like, I'm a mirror for my surroundings, we're tempted to say the simile is, I'm like a mirror for my surroundings. But that simile itself seems metaphorical, because the respects in which we're similar do themselves seem to be sort of metaphorical respects. So for these reasons, why it's, while it is kind of a natural view and it has some things going for it, the simile view is sort of, I think, not one of the more popular views of metaphor on the market these days.